Good, mor good morning uh, and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Before we begin with agenda item one today, can I note that we've had a change in membership and, and I, can I thank Donald Cameron for his hard work and input on the committee and I warmly welcome Dean Lockhart back to the committee as his replacement. Dean, can I ask you please to declare any interests which are relevant to the committee? Good morning, convener, and it's great to be back on the committee. I am a member of the Law Society of England and Wales. Otherwise, I have no other interests clear. Okay, thank you very much for that declaration, Dean. I'm most grateful. Um, the only item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill at Stage One. And I want to welcome our first panel of witnesses to the meeting. We have Professor Michael Keating, who is a Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen, and we have Professor Eileen McCarg, who is the Professor of Public Law and Human Rights at Durham University. If I may start the question this morning, folks. The Scottish Government have laid out the arrangements for parliamentary scrutiny in the Bill through subordinate legislation. And I wonder what your views are on these arrangements, and could I ask Professor McCarg to respond in the first instance, please. Good morning. Thank you, Convener. Um, well, I think what is I assume you're talking about the, the keeping pace power. Um, and I think what surprised me about the scrutiny arrangements in the this bill is that they are weaker than the, the scrutiny arrangements that uh, that there were in the original um, legal continuity bill that was ultimately not proceeded with, and that is uh, th those stronger scrutiny provisions were partly um, as a result of amendment during the parliamentary passage of the bill, but partly they were there uh, from the outset. Um, so there's two uh, main respects in which uh, the provisions are are weaker. So in in this bill, the choice is between negative procedure or affirmative procedure. Um, some types of regulations will have to be made by affirmative procedure, and there is the possibility for, um, uh, for, for applying affirmative procedure to other um, types of regulations, but the default um, would be negative procedure. Whereas in the first bill, the default was um, affirmative, with some provision for super affirmative. So super affirmative um, requires bills to uh, regulations to be laid in draft for a longer period and to be subject to consultation. Plus there was a sifting mechanism for the Parliament. So it was for the Parliament to decide whether or not the procedure chosen was an appropriate one. So I, I think it's surprising um, that this bill has come back, or this part of the bill has come back, with weaker scrutiny provisions, um, and I would suggest that, that the Parliament might want to uh, try to reinstate the, uh, the the stronger procedural protections that were there in the first iteration of the bill. Mr. Keating, do you want to make any comment? Uh, yes, I, I will answer that question, but if we can. Back up a little bit. I think first we need to ask what is the broad purpose of this bill, and I see two broad purposes that are not quite the same thing. One is the idea of trying to remain in dynamic alignment with the European Union. I can see the logic of that, but it only makes sense as part of a broader strategy. What does Scotland want out of Europe? Maybe we want to stay in dynamic alignment because. We don't think that the European Union has been resolved by Britain. So it may be on some other kind of relationship. And what I'd like to see there is some kind of philosophical statement as to what the Scottish Government sees the possibilities for remaining in Europe in all sorts of ways as being. We had this in Scotland's place in Europe. That didn't get very far. Something like that. And then how dynamic alignment might fit into that. And then how a special procedure might be justified because of the necessity of keeping up in dynamic alignment. The other possibility, the other philosophy behind it, maybe we just want to adopt European laws because we like those particular laws. In that case, I don't see the need for a specific 
mechanism, a fast track mechanism to keep up. I think that could simply be dealt with by ordinary law. Uh, as far as the confirmative negative procedure is concerned, I, I'd agree with uh, Aileen there. Uh, I think there's a lot of negative procedure here, really highly problem parliamentary accountability. It's part of a broader process in which both at Westminster and Holyrood we're seeing Brexit resulting in a loss of parliamentary accountability and um, uh, an increase in ministerial discretion. Okay, given that, uh, Professor Keaton, given that the number of EU regulations regulate seeds about a thousand annually, do you think that we could expect? How many of those do you think we could expect reasonably expect to see to be introduced? Using the powers. Well, we don't know. That's the problem. We need some broad statement as to what this is all about. Uh, what is the purpose of, of dynamic alignment? Is it just to stay aligned with everything, or, or is it we can pick and choose, or is there some broad strategy in which it may be important to stay in dynamic alignment? I don't know. With agri- and all we've got in the it's for some examples picked at random rather than a broad philosophy, so that we'd know what to look for. Because clearly. Try and keep track with everything that is coming out of the European Union would be impossible. So we know on what we need to know on what basis things are going to be selected. Okay, but given that likely future volume of potential instruments, whether whether they, they keep pace or not, what level of scrutiny by Parliament does the panel consider would be both proportionate and appropriate in these circumstances? And Professor McCarg, you want to kick oh, that one sorry. off? And I'll... Sorry. Aileen, you're mute. You're still mute, I think. Uh, okay. Thanks. I, um, well, I, mean, I think it, it, it really depends on, on what you're talking about. I mean, uh, you know, we, we might be talking about very technical amendments of um, existing areas of what will become retained EU law, uh, and in which case, you know, some relatively low level of scrutiny is appropriate. But but we might not. We might be talking about something much more significant because we might be talking about entirely new um, policy developments um, or significant amendments to existing areas of policy, um, where a much higher level of scrutiny would be appropriate. I mean, I would tend to to, to agree with with Michael that that you need to first of all make the case for there being um, th- this keeping pace power in secondary legislation at all. I mean, there may be a scenario in which um, the, 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 the 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 Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, uh, has no choice but to keep pace because perhaps there will be some kind of a future relationship with the EU that requires us to keep pace. If so, a, a power can be taken at that time because there will need to be implementing legislation. But if it's simply a question of choosing as a matter of, of, of policy choice to keep to, to keep pace, then it's much harder to justify um, this level of ministerial discretion, except for the most, uh, you know, minor and technical changes. But of course, minor and technical changes are very hard to distinguish from more significant policy changes. We saw, we've seen that already um, under the, uh, the 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 powers to to um, to correct retained EU law uh, conferred by the EU Withdrawal Act. There have been instances where uh, what were supposed to be minor and technical amendments have actually. Um, involve much more significant policy changes. So, you know, if we're talking about keeping up with the latest decision from the EU, or even possibly regulations, that might be one thing. If we're talking about implementing a new directive, I mean, I think we we must question whether uh, a ministerial power um, is the appropriate way to go at all. I don't see in that case that there are any justifications really of uh, pressure of time. Directives have a very long lead-in time. They usually have a lengthy time for member states to come into compliance. So there's no pressures of time justification there, and I think it's hard to see um, why those kind of policy choices should be ceded to the government rather than retained by the parliament. So you would, you would, that then, in that case, primary legislation you would be suggesting, um, or 
superaffirmative, perhaps? Well, yeah, superaffirmative, I think, would be the very least you'd want for something um, as significant as that. But my preference would be uh, for uh, for primary legislation uh, because you know ministerial powers of this nature ought to be seen as exceptional and as requiring um, some special justification. Now, the, the analogy is drawn with Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act, but that's an imperfect analogy for two reasons. One, um, we were under an obligation, or currently still are under an obligation, to implement EU law. We will not be under that, that obligation at the end of the implementation period, subject to whatever the future relationship is. And secondly, of course, um, the UK and Scottish MEPs participated in the, formula in the formation of EU law, and we won't be doing that um, in future either. We will become pure rule takers. So, in those circumstances, it seems very hard to me to justify uh, a power as extensive as this one um, in the hands of ministers. Michael, would you like to comment? Yeah, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And, and as for the, as far as monitoring is concerned, the Scottish Government, as it admits in the planetary notes of the bill, is going to have a big task on, on its hands trying to keep up with what's going on in, in Brussels. That's the first challenge. The Parliament will have a similar parallel challenge, and, and I'm not sure it's equipped to do that at the moment. It certainly would require a great deal of resource and effort to keep up with what is coming out of Brussels. And once again, I just repeat my point: we need some principles in advance to know what to look for, to know what sort of things might be important. Do you think, Michael, that would be a process where the Parliament and the government could come to an agreement on these sorts of things in terms of um, what would be super affirmative, what would be um, secondary legislation through a negative procedure? Because we've managed to do that in the past, where Parliament and government has come to agreement on how these things will proceed. Uh, yes, yes, certainly so. And of course, there are examples in other countries, there's Switzerland and the EA countries, there's, there's Norway, that has this issue all, all the time. And it might be worth looking at that experience, particularly the experience of the Norwegian Parliament, because it's not exactly the same, because of course, Norway is sort of obliged to implement EU directives through the EA arrangement, but they still have to be transposed into Norwegian law. And there's been quite a bit of discussion there as to the adequacy of parliamentary scrutiny in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Murdo, Fraser, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, and good morning to the, the panel. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions just following up really on the, the line of questioning from the Convener on parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and I should just start by reminding colleagues on my register of interests that I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland because I'll be referring to uh, their evidence and we'll be hearing from them. Uh, shortly, um, just on this question of, of parliamentary scrutiny, I mean the point is made both by the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates in their submissions around the appropriateness of the powers given to ministers to uh, introduce uh, new rules under this under this uh, bill. And as as was being teased out there by the convener, I think there's a distinction between you know, relatively minor technical changes to existing legislation, which you would expect to be done by secondary legislation, as opposed to the introduction of entirely new uh, policy areas, where, as the submissions say, we would be a rule taker, not a rule maker, because they have been made by an organisation of which we no longer have a, a formal role in. So, I suppose my first question is, how how do we draw a distinction between these two parts? The first part, technical changes that might be legitimately done in secondary legislation, and secondly, major policy changes that perhaps might be better done in primary legislation. Or is that even a possible thing to do? Maybe I can start with, with Aileen McCard uh, on that question. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a difficult thing to do um, because you know, minor and te technical versus major and policy are distinctions which are to some degree in the eye of the beholder. Um, in the original version of the uh, the, the bill, the, the legal continuity bill, the first continuity bill, 
um, there was a, a, a requirement that um, anything which uh, amended the functions or purposes of a public authority or which abolished an existing EU function without replacing it with something else were to be subject to super affirmative. And I, and I suppose those, those could be seen as proxy for um, a significant policy change, although I think it, they probably aren't exhaustive. There, there's other ways in which significant policy changes could, um, could occur. Um, but I think probably what was more important in that in that bill um, was the sifting provision that had been added to it. Um, so, you know, that, that allows the Parliament on a case-by-case -case basis to say, well, hang on a minute, you know, you're saying this is to be subject to the negative procedure, but actually it's more, it's more important than that, or, um, you know, or, or it's subject to affirmative, but actually, look, it's quite significant. It, it, it really should be, uh, should be bumped up a level. So I think that kind of procedural mechanism is probably um, more effective than trying to define exhaustively what is major in policy and what is uh, and what is not. I mean, I suppose the other thing that you could do, and, and I, I would suggest might be another proxy, but not a perfect one, is to distinguish between directives on the one hand and regulations and decisions on the other hand, because directives tend to be used for um, more significant um, policy changes, but not invariably because regulations are sometimes um, used for, for significant policy changes. Um, I mean, I suppose the other point to make as well, um, which maybe was relevant to the, the last question, um, is that secondary legislation is always suboptimal, because even under a super affirmative procedure, there's no power for the Parliament to amend. So it's always suboptimal. Um, and, you know, that there needs to be then some mechanism for saying, uh, not just shifting between different levels of secondary legislative procedure, but a mechanism for saying, no, this needs to be primary legislation. This cannot proceed under this power. Thank you. Just before I bring in Michael Keating, I really could ask a, a follow-up to that. Um, the, the justification in the policy memorandum for proceeding in this way with secondary legislation is that the government argues that the volume of legislation that is required means it could not be done by primary legislation because it would, in effect, clog up the statute book um, or the parliamentary process. I asked the bill team last week if they could give us a number of likely um, new regulations that would be introduced, and they, they, they could not do that. They could not even give us a guess. So, I mean, do you have any sense of the volume we might be talking about if, if we were looking at using primary legislation to deal with the major policy shifts? As opposed to the technical changes, what sort of volume of bills might we be looking at? Um, I mean, I, I don't have a, a figure I can give you. The, the The volume will depend on a range of different. So one will be uh, uh, where the Scottish government decides to use this power. I mean, I think in in the spice briefing, um, it, it said that the the Scottish government had said that they they don't intend to try to keep up with every every area of, of devolved competence that intersects with EU law, so that that takes out some. Um, there will be all sorts of other constraints on the ability to use the the, the, the keeping pace power as well, because um, uh, you know to, to the extent that uh, these kind of areas are replaced, say by EU by UK common frameworks. Um, or by um, other UK legislation, or potentially by new trade deals, and so on and so forth, that will again um, reduce the, the 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 area of discretion in which um, in, in which this power can be be used. So it's difficult to know what the um, what what the the, the volume um, is is likely to be. I mean, I suppose a proxy might be to uh, to look at. How much use has been made of Section 22 of the European Communities Act? That would be a starting point, but I would have thought that it's likely to be whatever the figure is. It'll be lower than that. It won't be. It certainly won't be higher than that, and it won't be the same as that because this part I don't think will be used. Uh, will be able to be used as extensively as Section 22. Okay, thank you. Maybe I could ask Michael Keating just for his 
view on those same two questions? Yeah, that takes me back to my first point. Is the objective of this stay in regulatory alignment as much as possible uh, to keep the dynamic alignment as much as possible to still regulations when we like them? And if it's the former case, then the volume is going to be enormous. If it's the latter case, then we need to know what is the purpose, what kinds of areas of the Scottish Government thinking uh, of. Um, without that, then it's very difficult to put a figure on all of it. It could be very minor. And another point, of course, is that things that might look technical can be politically very salient. Uh, little things become important because they're symbolic of bigger things. So we can never really anticipate what is going to be important politically as opposed to substantively. And certainly there's going to be the need for some kind of shifting mechanism, both at the governmental level and at the parliamentary level. Okay, Murdo. Yes, thank you, Governor. Yeah. Uh, okay, John Mason, please. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, possibly I don't mind, but possibly Professor McHarg uh, to follow on some of the things she was saying to Murdo Fraser. I mean, the, our Delegated Powers and Legal Reform Committee often produce quite boring reports, but uh, this one's quite interesting, and they've raised 16 questions. I'll not go through them all, but uh, one of the points they make is just, you know, how is it possible for the government to track all EU law? I mean, is there just not so much of it? That it's, it's it's almost going to be impossible to follow it all, and uh, following on from that, then choose which parts to follow. Well, I mean, it's not impossible because obviously it's done at the moment. There is a necessity at the moment to track um, to, to track what's happening in, in uh, the EU and to um, and to keep up with it. I mean, the the the, the the difference is, of course, that we won't be there. We won't be involved um, at early stages, and so it'll be more difficult to have uh, notice of what's coming. Um, and there will also be resource implications because, at the moment, we, we rely a lot on the UK government to. You know, it, it is the the, the, the member state. It, it's the one that that um, that participates at the, the EU level primarily. The Scottish government does as well, but it was primarily the UK. So there's resourcing implications. So you know, I think it, it's it's not that it couldn't be done. Um, it's just that it wouldn't be terribly easy, or it's certainly not going to be. Um, it's it's going to be more difficult than it is at the moment. Okay, thanks. And I mean, how, how much scope do you really think there will be for Scottish ministers to uh, keep pace? Because I mean, again, as the, has been pointed out by other witnesses, we'll have to comply with international obligations that the UK enters into, trade deals, common frameworks, the UK internal market, and uh, you know other issues as well. Is there really going to be much freedom? Well, again, we we simply don't know. I mean, we, we it, it's likely that there will be significant constraints. Um, the internal market proposals. Uh, if they are implemented in the form that that um, appears in the the white paper, um, won't technically uh, won't technically prevent the use of the keeping pace power. But what they'll do is uh, probably render it less useful in practice because um, because the the effect of Scottish divergence will be kind of uh, overrun by or overtaken by. Uh, whatever happens um, in other parts of uh, of the UK, um, so it, it's just very very difficult to to know at the moment what's uh, what's going to happen because there's still so much uncertainty. Thank you. I mean, Professor Keating, do you have any thoughts on that? How constrained Scottish ministers will be? Well, there'll be an obviously constraint. You just mentioned the, the internal market is really. Problematic. Uh, many of us have concerns about that bill because of the huge scope that it has. But I'd also add that there's a risk of confusion if we've got a, a rather ill-defined internal market provision that allows the UK to intervene, uh, in prescribing mutual recognition and undermining Scottish regulation. If we have trade deals, if we have frameworks, if we have these various sectoral bills, it creates a great deal of uncertainty rather than more certainty for the stakeholders. As far as keeping up is concerned, it will be important for the Scottish Government to anticipate what is coming up in Brussels, uh, 
not waiting for a directive or regulation to come up, but being there at the beginning to be in touch with stakeholders, business, civil society, to see what their concerns are and choose on the better with. It will be important for them on through trade. Uh, in that case, yes, there could be a monitoring. It wouldn't just be a question of the Scottish government, but it's a question of policy stakeholders being involved in, in all of that. That said, it, it is a monumental task and we'd need to have some guiding principles. You couldn't just go through these things one by one and look at everything. Again, as I said before, we need to know what is important and what is, is less important. But I am very worried about the proliferation of sources of regulation here, from trade deals through the internal market, through dynamic alignment. It could be for a great deal of confusion for, for business and other stakeholders. Uh, thanks very much. And I think my final kind of area would be, um, you know, going back to the question of how the government and the parliament relate to each other. I mean, the government may be watching all of these regulations and picking and choosing the ones it wants, but, but how does the parliament know should the Parliament know that you know maybe there's other areas which the government are not looking at, which actually we should be looking at? Well, yes, indeed. Now the Parliament is just not in a position to monitor everything that's coming out of Brussels, but the parliamentary committees, at least the the, the sectoral committees, specialist committees, should be aware of that. They should have a brief to see what is coming up. <laughs> In advance, and I emphasize that what is in the pipeline, what is worth yes. following through, uh, rather than trying to monitor everything that's coming out of the pipeline. Thanks, Professor McFarg. Finally, do you have anything on that? Uh, well, there is a, a provision in the bill for reporting by the Scottish government on the um, on the use of the power. I mean, it, you could extend that to non-use of the power. So, you know. Yes. Where is it not being used? Um, the issue there, of course, will be be timing. I mean, there's, there's no point in knowing uh, a year after the event that uh, oh, there was that, but we decided not to we decided not to use it. That that won't be too problematic um, in some circumstances. If if the reporting is looking ahead, um, but if it's you know simply a well we did this and we didn't do that, that's not terribly useful. So I, th I think you might want to look at those. Um, reporting mechanisms and exactly what it is that um, the, the Scottish Government is reporting on and also the time frames in which it is reporting. Is it looking ahead in those reports or is it simply a kind of static snapshot of what's happened in a particular period? Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Alexander Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, to Professor McHarg first, um, in addition to your concerns uh, and the alternatives, uh, you've already voiced. Uh, your NFU Scotland, in particular, are concerned uh, for the lack of scrutiny uh, and the lack of process for consultation, uh, particularly given the risk to trade from policy divergence. Um, but aside from these considerations, you know, which are, you know, look likely to produce unsatisfactory legislation, can I maybe ask a more fundamental question of, you know, is this bill actually necessary at all? Um, it, it, in terms of the keeping pace power, it may become necessary, as but that depends on what the future relationship is with uh, the with the EU. Um, at the moment, I would say that it is not necessary. Um, it's a, a choice, but of course. It is a legitimate choice for the Scottish Government to, to make that it, it wants to keep pace with EU law. That's a reasonable thing for a government to do. Um, but whether that then justifies keeping pace through secondary legislation, um, I, I would suggest it's this bill is not the provisions are not justified in the breadth that they uh, they appear at the moment. They they may be justifiable in terms of very, very minor technical amendments, but you know, how significant in practice an issue that is going to be, I'm not it's it's just impossible to say at the moment. And uh, Professor Keating. Yeah, well the UK government has made it very clear that it's not going to 
it pays in any shape or, or form. It makes its own regulations, which may or may not have the same regulation. So one can understand that the Scottish government, which has a different attitude towards Europe, might want to take a different position. It might want to keep a political choice. But also, and, and again, with relation for that, in the question in the case of agriculture, for example, is it important for the Scottish farmers and crofters that they should be able to keep pace with European regulations in order to get access to European markets? I'd like to see more explanation of that kind of issue in the justification for this provision. What, are the, what is the economic logic for it? Uh, thank you. And just as a brief follow-up, uh, my colleague Modo Fraser uh, talked about whether there are any examples of a volume of legislation. Uh, but the Faculty of Ag Advocates also spoke about uh, urgent changes at short notice, which is not something I, uh, most people would think is synonymous with, with uh, activities in Brussels. Uh, do, do you have any examples of, of, of those? I think that was to you, Michael. Uh, I think. Uh, you mean things that have come up short notice? Yeah. Uh, clarifying the question in Brussels in, in short I can't think of an example. It does happen from time to time that emergency action is taken or some anomaly comes or perhaps a ruling of the Court of Justice of the European Union that requires a change in policy. This thing happens from time to time. Uh, but mostly I would think it was a question of keeping pace with the broad thrust of policy. Now, the reform of the common agricultural policy is discussed endlessly. There's no secret about where it's going. And I think that is more important in policy terms to keep in touch with the broad thrust of policy. It may be in fact, almost certainly agricultural policy in Scotland and England are going to diverge. All the indications of the divergence that already exists will increase. Uh, we know that Brussels has been undergoing a long-term reform of the agricultural policy. It's going on for about 20 years. The UK, is, or England and Wales are going to have some radical changes. It will be important to take forward pictures and then from then comes the question of which directives and regulations you want to keep up with. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Under, um, Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to the witnesses. There's been uh, a little bit of discussion so far in the in the meeting about the relationship between uh, this bill and the UK internal market white paper and trade policy as well. Um, I wanted to explore that a little bit more uh, and and talk about whether they're in fundamental conflict or if they can be made to interact. From from my perspective. It looks as though they're incompatible. It looks as though the purpose of the Scottish government is to keep pace, and the purpose of the UK government is to diverge from Europe, to undercut Europe on standards, uh, and to impose those lower standards on Scotland, either through trade agreements with other countries or through uh, giving the, the private sector the right to, to challenge regulations under the internal market proposals. Is that too uh, ungenerous or too sceptical? Uh, an analysis, or is, is there a, is there a, a, a way in which these two sets of, uh, of of apparently conflicting agendas can be made to work together? If the UK internal market proposals come forward in the roughly the shape of the white paper and are legislated for, this bill is passed in the Scottish Parliament. Can they be made to work together, or are they fundamentally at odds? I mean, again, we 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 just don't really know how much divergence there will be in future. The, the, the UK government has said that it intends to maintain high standards of you know environmental protection and animal welfare and so on and so forth. It has said these things. Um, we we don't yet know whether. Uh, there will be whether that will be borne out in practice, or whether whether there will be significant divergence. What is clear is that if uh, trade agreements require uh, a divergence from EU standards, those trade agreements can be made binding on uh, the, the Scottish Parliament, even if they affect devolved areas. Um, as I said, the internal market provisions. Um, 
are more uh, nuanced than that in that they don't um, deprive the, the the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government of the power to diverge, um, but they will tend to undercut it in practice because in practice the standards that are applied in the largest part of the UK internal market, i.e. England, uh, will then be able to be goods and services complying with those standards will be able to be um, to be sold in uh, in the other parts of the, the UK. So, so that's a, a question of um, uh, practical effects rather than being um, undermined in principle. So, uh, you know, there is no there's no incompatibility, I don't think, with with the Scottish government and Scottish Parliament having some discretion to maintain alignment with EU law. Uh, whereas in other areas, it's you know it, it's bound to comply with international trade uh, agreements, or it's de facto um, driven by the English standards. But the question is how you know what is the extent of discretion, and and what we're what the concern is 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 that the area of discretion is being whittled away very very significantly. But you know the, the the idea in principle that there might be convergence in some areas and divergence in other areas. Well, that's that's devolution, right? That's that's inherent in the idea of uh, a distinction between reserved and devolved matters. We're talking about where the balance between those things lies. I think you, you could say it's inherent in devolution. But if the if the the evidence that we've heard uh, is correct that the UK internal market proposals do uh, in effect create new reservations. Uh, it does seem as though um, in what we what we currently recognise as the devolution arrangements would be fundamentally changed and un unable to work in the way that they currently do. Right. So we're talking about the the, the balance between um, the ability, the de facto ability of of or de jure ability in some cases of the devolved institutions to diverge uh, and their constraint to follow. Um, being constrained to a UK-wide uh, standard, um, yeah, that, that's where the issue lies. I don't think the uh, and and that that's I think it's important we we, we focus on that as the issue. The, the issue is not whether Scotland is able to maintain alignment with EU law, whereas England might not want to. That yeah, that, that's fair enough. That there's nothing, no problem about that. It's how much scope there's going to be for. Uh, divergence in practice. Thank you. Could I ask uh, Professor Keating to uh, address the same uh, the same issues, please? Yes, it, it's my hope of the internal marks going to be from just from the white paper. It seems to presumably add something to the frameworks which are being negotiated. So if it's going beyond the frameworks, it's it's going to be wider in scope. Just how wide in scope is not clear uh, at all. Potentially, it could be huge. The key provision there is about mutual recognition. That means if a good is recognised for sale in one part of the UK, it's for sale, it must be recognised for sale in other parts of the United Kingdom. It's based upon the EU mutual recognition principle, although it's, I should say, perhaps a misunderstanding of the EU mutual recognition principle, and that is why there's a concern that it might undermine Scottish standards because goods could be placed on the market, approved in England in consequence of a trade deal with another country and then be available in Scotland. We don't know how how how, how why that's happened, because in the EU things are taken out of the market. They're not part of the relation. Uh, uh, we don't know just how why that is going to be, whether there's the scope to diverge from internal markets ideas because of environmental concerns, for example, to go back to the question of, of, of agricultural policy. We, we simply don't know. And the critical, the other critical point is how the internal market is going to be administered and negotiated, whether it simply will be adopted by the UK Parliament, which is what the White Paper says, and be applicable everywhere, or whether it would have to be negotiated with the devolves as the frameworks are. Uh, and that, of course, is a, is a big point of conflict between the UK government and the Scottish and Welsh governments at the moment. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that that, that so the answer second question point is there, substantially yes. It could be yeah, it, it, it seems to me that second point there is the is the fundamental one. You started by saying the main difference is the scope, but if the UK government and the devolved governments uh, wished for common frameworks with much broader scope than they're currently discussing, they they are free to negotiate them, enter into them, uh, then later to change their policy, revise them, renegotiate, and what have you, because that's based on consent and mutual agreement. Uh, whereas the the internal market proposals are about the imposition by one government uh, on of, of something that others simply have to roll over and accept. So it's it's the it's the fundamental nature of it yeah, rather the, than the, 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 the government. Well, it's, it's both the, the UK government will define what the internal market means because it's objective concept is something that define what it means and then it will be define the modalities of, of, of implementing it mainly through mutual recognition thank you thank you both thank you Camila. okay uh, thank you dean lockhart please you know the environment committee last week heard evidence that under the EU Continuity Bill, it's an, an open question on whether Scotland keeps pace with the EU, adopts similar standards to the rest of the UK, or takes a completely different tack. Given the discretionary powers of the Scottish Government to keep pace with some, but not all, of future EU laws, is there a risk that Scotland could end up in some kind of regulatory no-man's land, whereby we are out of sync with EU regulations and also out of sync with regulations in the rest of the UK. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Keating could take that question first, please. Yes, that is. That, or there could be a great deal of, not about what the say, but how they are interpreted in the case of conflict. And we don't know where that will end up. It could end up in the courts. One problem that we've got in intergovernmental relations generally is we have really a very poor capacity to resolve these issues. We have no independent source of, of intelligence, of analysis of these kinds of things. And repeatedly we've said at this committee and other committees that that's something that is missing from the whole picture. Uh, but yes, it could make things very difficult uh, and it could create legal problems and this could pull up this one about to get to and I'm right. sure I lean on this but in court will cases where the law is not clear. I think we got most of that there in terms of your answer, Professor Keaton, but it was beginning to break up a bit. Um, so we'll need to just watch that. If at some stage we might just have to cut your camera but leave your sound to make sure that doesn't continue. But okay. I think it's okay now, but we're just about we're just about okay. Dean, sorry. Yeah, I I got uh, most of that. Th thank you, convener. Perhaps I could ask Professor McCarg uh, to respond to that question as well, please. Uh, well, so so two things. I mean, it's a political choice, you know, whether um, alignment with the EU, alignment with the UK, or some third way is. The best way to go. That that's you know that that that's a matter for the government and subject to to scrutiny by by the parliament. Um, I would just say that you know under the mutual recognition principle, um, we must remember that this works both ways. So anything that is compliant compliant with uh, Scottish regulation will also be able to be filled into. English and Welsh uh, Welsh markets. So it, it's not that, that goods would be um, you know, kept out of the market. It's more a question of uh, that we couldn't keep non-compliant goods out of our market, if that makes sense. So I think that the, the risk of a regulatory no man's land um, is, is not that uh, goods and services, Scottish goods and services, would be. Um, excluded 
from trading in other parts of the UK. That the, the mutual recognition principle is intended to ensure that they they can be. Oh, that, that, that's helpful. Con convener, if I may follow up with a, a related question, and, and thank you for those responses. Um, if Scotland does keep pace with future EU law, which, after all, is designed as a compromise between 27 EU member states, is there a risk that the rest of the UK will develop more appropriate and competitive uh, regulatory systems, which are more relevant to the needs of the UK internal market, thereby putting Scotland and businesses and consumers here at a comparative disadvantage? Is that, is that for me? Uh, yes, I mean, if, if, if oh, please. I mean, you're, you're getting into uh, to questions of, of, of economic judgment here. Um, what is or is not appropriate is, is, is a question of judgment that I'm not really uh, qualified to answer. I mean, I, I suppose just in terms of, of the technicalities of the keeping pace power, it is a power, it's not a duty. So there is no obligation on uh, the, the Scottish Government to, uh, to use that power, no, no obligation on the Parliament to approve the use of that power if it is felt to be, the, the, the rules being implemented are felt to be inappropriate to, to Scotland's circumstances. And Professor Keating, any uh, uh, thoughts on that uh, question? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's a matter of judgment as to what is economically competitive. But in, in any policy-making system, we've got a trade-off between the needs of producing at low cost, maintaining environmental protection, and, and social considerations. And it seems to be a legitimate choice for the Scottish Parliament to make and for the UK Parliament to make on behalf of England how that balance is, is, is struck. If actors don't like it, they can just vote the government. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, I think, Professor Keaton, we're going to cut your camera. So that we can hear you properly, because we're, we're getting a fair bit of disturbance. Uh, Alec Riley, was that a sub? Was that a sub you wanted in that area, Alec? No. Okay, no. I'll come back. To you. In that case, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. And uh, our two guests have covered some of um, this in previous responses to different questions. But I wonder whether we could uh, bring it all together. Um, obviously, the UK and devolved governments will no longer have a formal role in influencing the EU policy-making process, um, but I'm wondering what are the implications, therefore, for the keeping the pace power in the bill? And I'm happy to go to Professor Keating first. Sorry, you said what are the implications of the pace power? Yes, what, what are the implications of the keeping the pace power in the bill, given that we will, both the UK and devolved governments will have um, no influence whatsoever on the EU policy-making process. Well, that's that, that's highly problematic, and and uh, this is a position that Norway, as I mentioned before, has found itself in that it has to take policy; it doesn't have a way of making policy. There are various ways in which Scotland could try and get involved in policy networks, not so much as a government, but through trade associations, business associations that are consulted in Brussels. And it will be very important to stay in those networks as well as the governmental networks. Uh, certainly is the policy taker, but it's still making the decision whether or not to adopt these regulations from the EU. The bill is quite clear about them, would just, whether it be the Scottish Government deciding through statutory instrument, or whether the Parliament should properly decide these things through primary legislation. Okay, thank you very much, Professor McCall. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I'd make the same point that that the the the, the reduced influence uh, and scrutiny at the EU level has to be compensated for by increased scrutiny um, uh, at the domestic level. Um, I mean, I, I guess the, the the thing I would stress is this is a power 
it's not a duty, or at least at the moment, it's not a duty. Uh, and therefore, uh, whereas uh, our ability to um, reject uh, regulations implementing uh, EU law might be thought to be somewhat uh, hypothetical, um, the ability to reject regulations made under this power is not hypothetical because it's a choice, it's a political choice. Um, and so uh, I think it's incumbent on the Parliament as it scrutinises this bill to make sure that if this power is to remain, the provisions for scrutiny have to be appropriate to the nature of what's being proposed and have to be sufficient to allow the Parliament to make that democratic uh, decision about the content of the statute book. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Angela Constance, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning to our, our, our panel. The evidence that the committee has received thus far and what we've heard this morning, I think very helpfully separates out some strands. So on the one hand, we have you know really important technical considerations around process and, and scrutiny. But also, on the other hand, we have the political motivations and considerations which um, I would you know, contend are very uh, important in and around Scotland's future relationship with the EU, our economy, uh, the UK government trodden over the devolution settlement uh, and what amounts to a power grab. Now, I'm not expecting the, the panel to comment on my um, political views. But when I read the blog that Professor McHard contributed to in July, um, along with others, um, it, it gave the history um, of continuity bills um, past and present. And there was somewhat of a, and forgive me for saying, and I, I, I hope I'm not um, being unfair, but there was that, that, that um, I suppose, a bit of a vibe of despondency um, that you know, uh, given what happened with the first continuity bill, um, the authors say, you know, we've got a good idea how future disputes will end. Um, now, from my perspective, I don't want my government to be sitting back and just accepting that they're going to be overruled every twist and turn. But I wonder if Professor McHarg um, and uh, Professor Keating could perhaps summarise what would be a better way for the Scottish Government to achieve its very legitimate uh, political interests uh, and considerations? And is there a, a better way to mitigate uh, some of the risks uh, that you have outlined thus far, and particularly in Professor McHarg's blog? Yes, that's you, um, Professor Okay, thanks. Well, that, that's that's a, a big question. Um, I mean, I, I think if we if we go back to the to the the, the entirety of the Brexit process, um, what this has perhaps demonstrated is, is is what was true all along that uh, the UK Parliament remains sovereign, um, and that if it wants to have its have its way, it can do so. So any um, consent provisions, any commitment to negotiation, uh, to negotiated solutions, these operate at the political level rather than the legal level. Um, and you know that requires mutual commitment to make a system of consent and negotiation work. And I think what, what we've seen over the past uh, three or four years is the breakdown of that mutual commitment to, uh, to to proceed by consent. I mean, it's worth pointing out um, that even in relation to the Common Frameworks process, which is the Scottish Government and also the Welsh Government's preferred approach to the achievement of UK frameworks, because that's a negotiated procedure, even that is underpinned by the possibility of coercion, because in um, uh, in the EU Withdrawal Act of 2018, it is possible for the UK government to enact so-called freezing orders, um, which prevent um, the, the, the exercise of regulatory discretion 
by the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish institutions. So those have not been used yet, but that background threat of coercion um, remains. You know, it's a reminder that in, in all of this process, uh, the UK government, uh, uh, through its ability to uh, enact legislation in the UK Parliament, has the upper hand, and that is just the inevitable um, feature of the current constitutional settlement. Does that so not suggest it's broken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's that's beyond the remit of this particular session. I appreciate that. Does Professor Keating have anything to add? To reveal something we already knew about the UK Constitution uh, and the lacuna in the derogation settlement of 20 years ago. Preserve the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. That is an interpretive parliamentary, which is not quite the same thing. That interpretability of Westminster to impose its will whenever it wants to. So there's been a slippage. Parliamentary sovereignty has become Westminster can have the last word on everything, and that's good. The devil's understood. And when we were in the European Union, we had the idea there of, of shared sovereignty. Sovereignty is shared amongst the member states of the European Union, and that was a principle that could apply within the UK as well. Brexit is all about restoring sovereignty at the centre, sovereignty of Westminster or the unitary British people. And increasingly, since the referendum, we've seen governments in London interpreting the UK constitution in a very unitarist framework. And, and Brexit is, 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 is part of that. We, we decided, the British people decided, or whatever, that Brexit, therefore everything follows. Uh, and that has not introduced any formal constitutional change, but it's revealed the weakness of the devolution settlement and the ability, potentially, for UK governments to rebel. Share, sharing of power, sharing of sovereignty, back to an old-fashioned notion of Westminster supremacy. Thank you, convener. Um, I have no further questions as the um, panel have um, described um, the, the, the current power imbalance. Thank you. Okay, Alec Rowley, please. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, just a, a quick question, really more about the timing of this bill. I mean, I, I get that there are there are those who would argue that there is absolutely no need for this bill. But if we took a leap of faith and said, yeah, we, we, we need some kind of bill, given the the uncertainties, the maybe's eye and maybe's no approach to this bill, given that we have a white paper on the internal market, but we don't know yet what the legislation will actually look like, and given that we really don't know where we're going to be in January next year, in terms of having a deal with Europe, not having a deal with Europe, should we, or is there a reason that you would have to bring forward if you believed that you needed this bill, you need this legislation? Is there a good reason for doing it now, or, or is it legitimate to argue that we should actually wait and see what kind of position we find ourselves in at the beginning of the next year? Um, well, if you believe you need this power, it, it's sensible to be prepared. Um, the ministers, the Scottish Government also has uh, currently has powers under the EU Withdrawal Act to, uh, to to modify retained EU law, but that expressly says, or to correct deficiencies in retained EU law, that expressly says deficiencies do not include um, failure to implement. Uh, new developments in EU law. So, so that power clearly doesn't extend to this keeping pace uh, provision, and also those powers to modify retained EU law uh, will expire um, two years after implementation day. Um, so, if you think this is necessary, then it, it is it is sensible to have it in place uh, for when um, the implementation period ends. Um, uh, the European Communities Act will cease to, to be uh, to, to be in force, uh, 
Um, and certainly in relation to the other provisions of the bill in terms of environmental protection, uh, the, the, the framework of, of EU enforcement will fall away. Okay, thank you. That's me, Bruce. Professor, Professor Keaton, do you want to say anything before we move on? No, I, I agree with what Eileen Okay, well, well, thank you very much. Nobody else has indicated a wish to contribute in this particular panel session. So, can I thank Professor Keating and Professor McCarg kindly for their evidence today? I'm very grateful for that. I'm now going to suspend for two to three minutes just to ensure that our next panel is in place and is ready for the next session. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I welcome now our second panel of witnesses to the meeting. First of all, Kenneth. Campbell QC from the Faculty of Advocates, and Michael Clancy will be E, who is Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland. And can I remember, remind MSPs that they should direct their questions to a named witness? I, I don't know how much of the previous um, evidence both Kenneth and Michael were able to hear, but we were having a discussion about the appropriateness of the subordinates legislation. For keeping pace power where it was adequate. adequate. So, can I put, put my first question to Kenneth? <clears throat> because, Kenneth, in your submission to the call for evidence, and on page two, you, you say that the, as far as the utilising um, statutory instruments are concerned, that the, if I've got this right, the faculty considered that there was some force in the policy memorandum for following that direction. And can, well, well, at that particular point, given that the UK government in policy areas such as fisheries, agriculture, and environment, um, <clears throat> will, and the bills that they're proposing will allow UK ministers to introduce statutory instruments and policy areas that were previously within the competence of the European Union. Are these not provisions not remarkably similar to what are being proposed in the continuity bill here at Holyrood, and are quite wide ranging? So, Kenneth, would you like to kick that off? Yes, um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I've not had the uh, opportunity to uh, look, look at the detail of um, the uh, uh, fisheries uh, bill, but I'm aware, in general terms, that there are uh, powers of the kind um, uh, you describe. Um, and um, uh, I imagine, um, uh, though I'm not privy to uh, the uh, the UK government's thinking about this, I imagine uh, their uh, rationale for taking powers of that kind is um, uh, similar to the uh, uh, the rationale which um, Scottish ministers uh, have um, uh, said uh, underlies the um, uh, the form in which the uh, powers uh, are sought. In uh, this bill, so uh, one one can see why um, that might be. Um, and uh, as um, uh, uh, you, uh, you suggested, um, uh, convener, um, uh, there is um, uh, something uh, in in the rationale um, for taking uh, powers uh, by a, a subordinate legislation, in part because we really don't know. A number of um, things uh, about the areas in which these powers uh, are going used. I, I heard part of the uh, the earlier session um, uh, this morning, and I know that that's uh, something that uh, you discussed with uh, the witnesses. And there may be questions for uh, Michael Clancy and myself about uh, that uh, a little later this morning. Michael, would you like to reflect on that? Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I suppose uh, the uh, point about whether uh, UK ministers uh, would adopt uh, EU law uh, in the fashion which is suggested under the, the bill before us uh, would depend on uh, the powers which are in the relevant re legislation. Uh, so, for example, uh, if uh, if a bill uh, which operated in an area relating to EU law, uh, where there was a substantial 
um, corpus of EU law. Um, the uh, in that bill, and that might not be the same in every instance of every piece of legislation which relates to EU withdrawal. So, for example, uh, in the Agriculture Bill, uh, the, the powers are pretty specified uh, to, uh, to those relating, for example, to direct payments uh, or other uh, uh, such things. And, uh, of course, we've, we've seen the, the, the LCM go through uh, the Scottish Parliament relating to that in terms of the red meat levy and Regulation Michael, making power is sorry, particularly limited. To sorry, Michael, sorry to interrupt. We got you to red meat levy and then it started to fall over a bit there. Could you start from there again? Apologies. Yes. Um, it, so it would depend, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. It would depend if there were regulation making powers in the parent legislation which would enable UK ministers to uh, take a view as to whether or not they would. Uh, be able to use EU law. That having been said, um, it, what, uh, there is a point at which EU law uh, and what is um, domestically grown law uh, might be very similar in their terms and be arrived at quite independently. Or there could be In a, say, in a way uh, which would enable uh, UK ministers here to be influenced, as indeed Scottish ministers might be influenced uh, by developments in EU law, which they would think would be useful for the people of the UK or the people of Scotland, as the case requires. Yeah, and of course, not only do we have these specific bills suggested in areas of fisheries, agriculture and the environment, if I recall correctly, the EU Withdrawal Act itself had some statutory instrument powers that the UK government gave themselves, which are pretty wide ranging, where they could, if they choose, choose, uh, much like the Scottish government is saying, they, would, they could choose whether or not to implement you know, similar EU law. The UK government could do the same under the some of the provisions in the EU Withdrawal Act, Michael? Well, uh, remembering that, that um, it's maybe under the Withdrawal Act, but it's not under the European Communities Act. So it's not, in a sense, implementing EU law uh, in the way in which it has been implemented in the past. Uh, it, it, it is implementing EU law as a matter of choice rather than as a matter of obligation. And I think that's quite an important point to emphasise, and that then gives whichever government chooses to, to pursue this path the opportunity to depart from the law which the EU is making at, at any one time and to tailor it to the situation and particular problems or, or issues which the government, whichever government it is, is facing at the time. Okay, thanks. Of course, that's the same situation for, for the UK and for Scotland, because the Scottish Thank government you. are saying that they will choose whether or not they will, they will bring forward implementation. Now, I'm, and I'm just touching on these areas at the beginning uh, in a general way, because I know others will want to come in on some of the specifics. But also, you, you'll both be aware that this bill has been considered at the same time as consideration is being given to the Trade Bill and the UK Government White Paper on the internal market. To what extent, therefore, is it likely that the power to keep pace with the EU law will be undermined by future restrictions on devolved competence by the UK Parliament or UK ministers? Do you want to pick up on that first, Kenneth, and I'll come back to Michael? Um, yeah, I think um, uh, this, 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 this is an interesting and important um, uh, issue, um, uh, and I suspect uh, we haven't, of course, seen what uh, the shape of um, legislation uh, to implement the internal market um, uh, uh, will be. Though we we do have a trade bill currently before 
uh, the UK Parliament. So uh, one can see some of the, uh, the issues that you describe, uh, convener. Um, I suspect that um, uh, there may not be um, formal provisions which, uh, as it were, um, uh, preclude um, exercise of powers of the kind which are here in um, uh, the Continuity Bill, uh, but um, uh, the practical uh, effect of the interaction of these uh, three pieces of legislation, that's to say the Continuity Bill, the Trade Bill, and whatever shape legislation um, takes to implement uh, the internal market, the practical effect of those uh, may be in some um, uh, sectors uh, to uh, limit the practical value of um, the powers which are sought in the Continuity Bill. Um, it's difficult uh, immediately to um, give a, an example of where that might happen, but it seems, given um, uh, what one can discern about the policy drivers, that that's likely. Okay, M Michael, just before you start, just so people who are watching our proceedings are aware, we've cut the cameras to both your, both Kenneth and yourself, Michael, to ensure that we can hopefully boost the signal via audio. In case those who are watching wonder why we can no longer see it. So sorry, sorry to interrupt that, stage, Michael. I just thought it was important to get that said. On you go. Um, thank you, uh, Convener. It's um, the constraints on uh, the powers in in the uh, uh, the withdrawal uh, uh, from the European Union Continuity Bill uh, are quite uh, quite a number actually when you look at it uh, because it's it's not simply um, uh, such constraints as may be uh, within the trade bill, but within the, uh, any trade agreements which are made uh, in the future, there may be constraints upon uh, the, uh, the power uh, of uh, the Scottish Government to act. Uh, there might also be uh, issues around and about the internal market, as we heard in the, uh, the first session, and whatever the internal market bill uh, contains. Uh, and, of course, there are the self-evident constraints uh, of working within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Ministers. So, um, it, this is a, a bill which it will uh, require, I think, some careful navigation. It is one of the few bills uh, which I have ever seen uh, which sets out uh, the objectives of the bill, uh, the purpose and effect. Um, in uh, section 42, uh, which is specifically to make provision in connection with the withdrawal of the UK from the EU in consequence of the notification to withdraw, uh, and uh, to, uh, insofar as any provision of this Act would, if it were in effect before the relevant time, be incompatible with EU law, the provision is to have no effect until the relevant time, which is uh, when uh, the uh, transition uh, period finishes, and that I think is, is uh, sets out the constraints within the bill, uh, in addition to the uh, technical ones which we might come to later, such as uh, not making criminal offences, not exceeding the competence of the Parliament, and such. Um, and I think that that's that's where where I, I sit on on uh, the extent in which this is a wide bill or a narrow one. Thank you, Michael. I, I intentionally asked wide-ranging questions at the beginning to allow my, co my colleagues to come in with some more of the specifics. So, Murdo, over to you. Um, thank you, thank you, Convener. Um, I've got some questions around parliamentary scrutiny, but I wonder if I could just start by asking a follow-up to the question the Convener asked about comparisons with equivalent UK legislation. Maybe I could ask Michael Clancy this in the first instance. I mean, is there a distinction between what UK legislation is doing and what this bill is doing, insofar as the UK legislation is focused on retained EU law, but this is actually something different in quality? This is a keeping pace measure that will seek to import uh, new EU laws into Scots law, and that, that means it's different in character. Is that fair? Yes, I think that is a fair assessment because the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 
is precisely that. It's to uh, remove uh, the, um, uh, the European Communities Act uh, 1972 section, uh, sections which uh, oblige compliance with EU law uh, and to establish the uh, domesticated EU law, which we understand is retained EU law. So uh, that, that, that is the schematic uh, of the uh, Withdrawal Act of 2018, and that is different from uh, the provisions of this bill, which, as you have pointed out, Mr Fraser, um, uh, are uh, focused on ensuring that uh, the Scottish Government has the option uh, to adopt um, uh, provisions corresponding to uh, EU regulations, tertiary legislation, or EU decisions, etc., as defined in Section 1 of the Bill. Um, it, I, I think it is it's also quite interesting, if I might uh, also uh, bring in at this point, the reference uh, to these elements, regulations, legislation, decision, or directives, having effect in EU law after IP completion day, which is, of course, the 31st of December 2020. Uh, and uh, if one looks for the definition of EU law in the interpretation uh, part uh, of Part One in Section Eight, uh, EU law doesn't appear there, uh, but it does appear in Section Forty-Two, uh, which I will express my uh, delight at, um, uh, where it refers back to uh, the meaning given in the Scotland Act, nineteen ninety-eight, Section. 126 subsection 9, but it's but the definition is applicable only there for the purposes of section 42, not for part 1. So that leaves the question is, what do the government mean in section 1 when they say uh, that uh, as these uh, aspects of, of legislation have effect in EU law, and why do they not apply the definition in the Scotland Act to the provisions in part 1? Okay, thank you very much. I hope we were all following that, colleagues. Um, <laughs> maybe I could ask. We may see it in Maybe I could ask my next question to um, again to yourself, Michael Fancy, then bring in bring in Mr. Campbell uh, afterwards. And I don't know if you caught the first session uh, with the witnesses, but essentially I want to ask the same question to you, to you both. That I asked them, which is around the levels of parliamentary scrutiny. And you make the point uh, in, the, in the Faculty of Advocates submission that um, these provisions would make Scotland a rule taker, but not a rule maker. Now, I think we all accept that there are areas of retained EU law which will need you know, minor uh, amendment and modification post uh, Brexit. Uh, and doing that by secondary legislation may well be appropriate. But the more contentious area is around to import new EU laws for which we have not been consulted or been involved in the making of um, to uh, Scots law, and that's a, a different order. And I suppose my question, therefore, is: Is it appropriate to do that latter job by secondary legislation as is currently being proposed? Um, and if, if you, depending on your view on that, how easy is it to draw a distinction? Between minor technical changes that might be done by regulation and more substantial policy changes that should be done, you know, at least by, um, for example, a super affirmative um, uh, procedure or perhaps by separate primary legislation. And maybe start with yourself, um, Michael Clancy. Thank you very much, Mr. Fraser. So, I think. The, uh, the bill is, is quite clear that uh, Scottish ministers ha are, are taking are being rather loaned the power uh, to make this law by, by Parliament uh, for a specified period of time, of course, which is in the bill ten years with other uh, accruals of five year uh, up to a ten year uh, period in addition. Um, and I think it's important that we recognise that Scottish ministers will be making the choice of which legislation to um, uh, align with, uh, but uh, we won't know um, uh, unless there is some additional provision uh, as to what legislation Scottish ministers have decided not to align with. Uh, 
uh, and that is not uh, given to uh, to Parliament to decide at all. That it will be be a, a, a ministerial decision, and I, I think that that's that's uh, the uncharted territory uh, which this bill uh, does uh, does not uh, lay bare, um, and which one might want to explore uh, at a future juncture with the appropriate people. Given the, the, the concept of scrutiny uh, as being something which is dear to the Parliament's uh, heart and uh, an essential part of its function, I think that the, the bill um, may not satisfy the Parliament uh, by, by its restraint to um, secondary legislation, whether by affirmative or by uh, negative resolution procedure. The uh, previous legislation, uh, the Legal Continuity Bill uh, of 2018, it should, uh, should be adopted um, in this context, and that is that, uh, uh, that at a minimum, uh, super affirmative uh, legis uh, sub subordinate procedure uh, should be applied to these cases uh, where there is a substantial policy consideration uh, in the EU regulation, tertiary legislation or decision, uh, as the case may be. Uh, and if there is an insubstantial um, uh, uh, application of the uh, EU legislation, then uh, the case might be made for affirmative or for negative procedure. It's clear also that there is no indication of when Scottish ministers would use primary legislation. Uh, and that's one of the uh, uh, options in keeping pace is to, to use a bill rather than regulations. Uh, and uh, Law Society thinks that, that uh, uh, this uh, should be an option uh, which uh, Scottish ministers are quite clear about being able to use and set out the circumstances and criteria which they would apply when seeking to do so. Okay, thank you. Mr Campbell? Um, uh, thank you. Um, to take the, uh, the last part of your question first, how easy it is, is it to draw a distinction between a minor technical um, uh, uh, amendment and something more substantive. Um, uh, in terms of defining that on the face of, a, of the bill, uh, I think um, uh, I would, uh, uh, from from a legal point of view, that's quite difficult. Um, it, of course, it's the sort of thing that we might feel we would recognise if we saw it. Uh, but that's rather different from uh, defining it in a useful way, which is going to assist uh, both um, uh, ministers in deciding the way in which they're going to introduce legislation and the parliament uh, in taking uh, an appropriate view about um, uh, scrutiny. Um, <coughs> uh, so I think um, uh, that's, the, uh, 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 that's the harsh practical reality uh, about that. Um, I suspect that said that very many um, I mean, uh, very many um, legislative instruments are likely to be relatively technical in the sense that um, they build on existing policy choices. Um, uh, that's the sense I have of um, uh, uh, much uh, of a, a proportion of the existing um, legislation implementing uh, EU uh, obligations. Uh, other witnesses have rightly pointed to the more difficult class of cases where there is a new um, policy direction, um, and um, I agree with uh, uh, what um, Michael Clancy um, uh, said about the need for a more um, exacting uh, form of um, scrutiny for uh, for those. Um, the super affirmative um, process, which is not present in this bill at the moment, but which was in the, the previous continuity bill, uh, might be one model. Um, the, the wording of, uh, the, of section um, at one um, of uh, the current bill is permissive, so in some circumstances it would be open uh, to Scottish ministers to introduce primary legislation, uh, I suggest. 
uh, the real issue is um, how could the criteria for that choice be defined? Here, the difficulty, and I think this is a genuine difficulty, is um, that it, it, I just don't think that could be exhaustively done um, because of the uh, the range of um, policy um, uh, competencies uh, uh, which um, the EU currently has and which in future uh, it might um, uh, acquire, um, uh, and uh, uh, a question which um, uh, immediately suggests itself is uh, it would be, well, should the choice about uh, the form of legislation be tied to um, existing uh, policy? In other words, should one say, well, um, if um, a proposal is made to change a, a, an existing policy area, then that requires a particular type of uh, legislation. That seems um, a, a rather uh, blunt uh, tool, uh, and I suspect that might give rise to unforeseen um, uh, uh, consequences as well. So there is um, uh, there is a real uh, a difficulty here. Um, that said, the um, uh, the type of uh, uh, changes uh, to the law which are um, uh, envisaged by um, Section 4.2 of the Bill, for which the affirmative uh, procedure um, uh, is to be invoked, uh, are obviously extremely important, and that might be a starting um, uh, place. Uh, one might think that some of those actually require something more than simply the affirmative procedure, but uh, um, there would be room for argument that they should have uh, the super affirmative uh, procedure. I think that's probably all I want to say about that one. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Bardo. Uh, John Mason, please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener, and thanks uh, to the witnesses for what they've said so far. Um, I'm kind of focusing on some of the points that the DPLR committee raised. Um, in, the, in the first place, just given the volume of EU law, do you think it's possible for the, the Scottish Government to really keep track of all of that, given that, that we don't have to? It's, a, it's partly a question of resources. Sorry, I don't mind uh, Mr Keating first, perhaps. Um, no longer there, so sorry, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong panel now, aren't I? Uh, Mr Clancy, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I'm glad to say you didn't say Professor Clancy. Uh, that was really <laughs> confusing. Same yet, same yet. And it's certainly something which I, I will never attain. Uh, but, um, uh, yes, it, it's a very interesting question uh, about monitoring EU law. Uh, as you'll see from uh, our submission, uh, the Law Society of Scotland collaborates with the Law Societies of England and Wales and Northern Ireland uh, in maintaining a, an office in Brussels, uh, where we uh, employ I think, uh, six people, um, uh, and uh, that that is focused on uh, horizon scanning. Uh, interaction with the European institutions, um, uh, discussion with uh, Commission officials and, and others, and arranging meetings uh, for uh, those of us who have something to say uh, in the, the European arena. It's quite a big job, and it's not a cheap job to do that, and we cannot cover everything that the European institutions uh, decide to look at. Uh, and that's uh, underscored. Uh, by, of course, the type of work which uh, solicitors do. So uh, we might have a, 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 an idea of making sure that we're, we're following uh, EU family law developments or uh, developments in relation to anti-money laundering, uh, or some aspects of criminal uh, jurisdictional law uh, and uh, civil judicial cooperation. These have been the sort of typical things which we have uh, been looking at over the years. But of course, it's only a small portion of the EU output. There is an indication, and I'm sure that, that the Scottish Government uh, has been looking at this, it would be remiss of it uh, had it not been, um, in terms of uh, every Commission's work programme. Uh, and the current Commission work programme, uh, which has of course been thrown off course by the coronavirus uh, crisis, it tells us that there are 
44 work streams uh, in in the EU uh, under the uh, under this particular work program, uh, which will result in legislation in almost every one of those areas. And I can send on a copy of the additional work program for the committee's interest. And it's it is very very broad indeed, um, uh, and it's so uh, and takes account of uh, things like uh, cultural development, the green agenda, um, environmental matters, um, uh, and, other, and others like that. So that's quite a job, and for the Scottish Government's office in Brussels uh, to be um, looking at these kinds of things with a view to highlighting uh, those which uh, it would uh, put to the Scottish Government as germane to be uh, enacted into Scots law uh, by the powers in this bill, uh, there would have to be a lot of uh, thought, a lot of resources, uh, and a lot of time devoted to uh, that, both in Brussels and in Edinburgh. And just okay, to give I appreciate example, that. Before, before I come to um, Mr Campbell, where does that leave the Parliament and even this committee? Because I think the point was made already that um, you know we don't we may not know what's going on in Europe and are we totally reliant on the on the Scottish government to tell us what they want to copy or do you think we should be also trying to follow the what's happening in Europe? It's difficult to do it um, exclusively from abroad, as it were. Um, the UK Parliament maintains representation in Brussels. Uh, but the Scottish Parliament, I think, gave up its representation in Brussels uh, quite some time ago. I remember maybe 10 years ago giving evidence to the European uh, Affairs Committee in the, the Parliament alongside Ian Duncan, uh, who was the Scottish Parliament's rep in uh, Brussels, now Lord Duncan of Springs Bank. Um, uh, so it just shows you where you can go if you get a job doing uh, that work for the Scottish Parliament. Unfortunately, the Parliament does not have that representation in Brussels any longer, uh, but that may be something which, paradoxically, at a time when the UK has left the European Union, the Parliament may want to consider how it monitors uh, legislative change in uh, Europe uh, and what resources it wants to devote to that. And I was just going to point out that, that uh, as I said, the legislative agenda had been thrown off course by the coronavirus crisis. But nevertheless, uh, since uh, the start of this year, um, uh, on coronavirus, uh, the European Parliament has, has issued 32 regulations, 14 decisions, and one directive. So that gives you an idea of, even in a time of stress, the amount of legislation which the institutions yeah. uh, can produce. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Campbell, do you uh, have the same kind of view of the quantity of legislation? Uh, yes, broadly, broad, broadly I do. Um, and uh, Michael Clancy has identified um, a, 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 in part of his answer a range of uh, areas which the Law Society um, uh, uh, takes, an, takes an interest in, uh, in detail, uh, all of which, of course, are within the competence um, of um, the Scottish Parliament. and. Uh, uh, there will be others, even uh, if um, uh, only half of the 42 work streams of the Commission fall within devolved competence. That is still quite um, a large number of areas uh, to monitor. Uh, and I quite agree with um, uh, Michael Clancy that um, uh, experience shows that being um, on the ground in Brussels is the best uh, way to um, uh, develop early awareness of the direction of uh, future legislation. Now, uh, it is a matter for um, uh, uh, this committee and uh, for others in the Parliament to decide whether the um, parliamentary representation is the best way to do it. There are, of course, um, pan-European networks of uh, interest groups and stakeholders, the Scottish component of which the Parliament may already uh, engage with, and uh, that might be um, a, a source of uh, useful information about uh, ongoing developments in Brussels. But I suspect Michael Clancy is right that it may be there is no substitute for actually being there. Okay, thanks very much. If I could stay with you, Mr. Campbell, um, 
we've talked to the convener already talked about some of the constraints that would be on Scottish ministers. I noticed in the evidence that was submitted from the Faculty of Advocates that you said uh, we cannot have reciprocal agreements, and I just wanted to get your confirmation that that is the case. So, for example, with the arrest warrant or the uh, insurance health insurance card, um, that is not is that definitely not possible for Scotland to have uh, if the UK doesn't want it. Um, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's our view, and that's because um, uh, the EU um, uh, enters into uh, the reciprocal arrangements of that kind with um, uh, third states, um, and uh, Scotland uh, is uh, not uh, in that uh, position. Uh, so there would be, um, uh, however much they might uh, wish to do that, uh, there would be. Uh, uh, practical reasons why they couldn't. Okay, thanks very much. And my final point, if I may, convener, um, was the whole question of uh, how broad Section One is. Um, I, I, my impression from the evidence that you both submitted uh, was that you're quite happy it should be broad and it, it, it can't really be too specific. But I think we've got other people feeling maybe it should be more specific. So can you give me just something in your thinking of that? Uh, we'll start with sorry, Mr. Campbell, to start with maybe. Uh, yes. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I think the um, uh, the choice about uh, alignment um, or not is, um, uh, is is a policy choice. Once uh, you take uh, that um, decision, uh, then um, because of the breadth of uh, existing uh, policy uh, competence, uh, first of all, on the part of the EU, and then second, secondly, uh, on um, the part of um, uh, the Parliament uh, and uh, the, uh, the Scottish Government. Um, it's um, uh, uh, the starting point. I think is um, a broad, broadly defined power is um, uh, is necessary simply because we can't. Um, foresee the direction of uh, policy within the EU, particularly as um, uh, Scotland and the UK are no longer part of that policy process. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, Mr. Clancy, if you can give your view on that, and I think you also wanted maybe to say something about reciprocity, if I'm saying it correctly. Well, yes, and, and I'll start with that, and I agree with what uh, Kenneth Campbell. Reciprocity. Um, however, I think it's quite difficult uh, in certain instances within devolved competence uh, for uh, the uh, uh, Scotland to even contemplate uh, reciprocity. Um, uh, firstly, because uh, Scotland is not a state, uh, and uh, therefore the EU uh, will deal with states and create reciprocal arrangements with states, but but not with uh, uh, elements of or elements of states, as it were. Um, and secondly, um, uh, some of the issues, such as the European arrest warrant, are considered to be integral to the European Union, uh, and uh, and quite difficult to extend beyond the boundaries of the European Union. Um, uh, so, for example, in Germany and some other countries, there is a constitutional prohibition on extradition uh, to uh, to third countries, uh, and and I think that that's quite important for us to realise that reciprocity is not necessarily in the gift of the EU, because member states themselves may have their own requirements uh, which prohibit that kind of uh, agreement. On the point of the breadth of uh, Section One, um, uh, yes, uh, as as I've said, uh, it, it's based on uh, Section Two of the European Communities Act in 1972, uh, uh, and details all the various types of legislation which uh, Scottish ministers may, by regulations, uh, bring into uh, Scots law. But um, uh, there are constraints which lie out with. Uh, the, the terms of, of uh, Section One, 
and that in, imports the policy decisions which Scottish ministers uh, may take uh, in, in, in deciding which legislation to apply. Section 1-2, uh, uh, and that's a political question on which the Law Society would not comment, uh, and also the various other constraints which we've already discussed both in the previous session and earlier in this one. Thank you. Thanks, John. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, and if I could uh, just address uh, Michael Clancy first on my question. Um, you know, Im importantly, you've said you know, this bill is very much a, about cho a choice, not an obligation. Uh, and in the previous session, uh, we heard many of the problems, drawbacks, uh, and alternatives uh, with what's being proposed. And on top of this, uh, bodies such as NFU Scotland uh, you know, have voiced a concern over the uh, lack of process for consultation. Uh, particularly given the risk to trade uh, from policy divergence. Uh, so can, can I just go back to a more fundamental question uh, of whether you think this bill is necessary at all? Well, of course, um, that's really a question which you should address to Scottish ministers. Um, uh, they are the ones that set uh, the policy for bringing forward bills. Um, it's, it's not for the Law Society to comment upon the necessity or not of a bill. Um, I think that uh, uh, our comments uh, are focused on if the Parliament wants to legislate in this way, uh, then there are certain things which have to be taken into account. Uh, and one of them is the uh, lack of uh, any kind of democratic trace uh, on uh, in terms of uh, Scotland or the wider UK, or on involvement in the creation of future uh, EU law. It's, it's uh, quite obvious uh, no elected person uh, from uh, Scotland uh, or the wider UK uh, will have voted on future EU law. Uh, and that is a significant issue uh, when wanting to then enact that law in Scotland. Uh, and that's why uh, appropriate scrutiny, proper consultation, uh, and all the uh, engagement which goes along with those uh, concepts uh, is important um, in, in making sure that uh, when Scottish ministers bring forward proposals to legislate as uh, they might do under Section 1, uh, that uh, the people of Scotland, parliamentarians, and stakeholders broadly have the opportunity to make their views known about that legislation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell. Thank you. Um, uh, as with um, uh, the Law Society, so with uh, the Faculty of Advocates in terms of uh, not having uh, a position about um, uh, policy um, uh, decisions which um, are at root. Um, uh, uh, this is. Um, I agree. Uh, having said that, I agree with uh, all that um, Michael Clancy went on to say uh, about the uh, the operation of the uh, the legislative process, and I don't think I want really to uh, to add to anything he has said about that. Uh, thank you. I mean, just on that, I mean, I can, I can understand why you wouldn't comment on on, on the politics of it, but, but do you, is there any actual necessity for it? Was my question. Um, well, having um, taken a policy uh, uh, choice to maintain uh, alignment uh, with uh, uh, the EU, uh, then a process for doing that is um, uh, uh, is necessary, and uh, uh, the bill is the means by which um, uh, the Scottish government uh, seeks to do that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexander. Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you, convener, and, uh, and good morning to, to the witnesses. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that I might be uh, about to ask you to uh, again uh, stray into areas that you wouldn't be comfortable with. I, I was discussing the, the potential interaction with or conflict with uh, the UK proposals on the internal market. If, uh, if legislation on that comes forward in the in the way that it's been proposed, uh, or indeed with Potential future trade agreements. Uh, whether the the, the the bill, the Scottish government's bill that we're talking about today, is compatible with those um, 
those other aspects of the of the context that we're working in. Now, you you may not be in a position to comment on the generalities of that, uh, but the the UK internal market proposals do cover as part of their scope, for example, issues around the the regulation of professions, uh, professional qualifications rather, and um, you know potentially issues that would impact on the provision of of legal services. So perhaps specific to those aspects, uh, what issues or, or problems do you foresee arising if there's a, a conflict or a, a mismatch, a misalignment between uh, the, uh, the UK-wide system for recognising professional qualifications uh, and a, a Scottish system that emphasises keeping pace with the EU? Um, would that have a, 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 a potential you know, unpredictable consequences, and if there was such a conflict, where should it be resolved? Which government should be in a position to decide whether the public benefit of the approach they wish to take outweighs uh, any negative consequences uh, in terms of a, a mismatch between the two systems? Um, can we come to uh, perhaps Mr Campbell first of all, and then Nancy? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is a um, e e even even confining it to specific areas. This is a a very big um, a question, a very important mm -hmm. uh, topic um, uh, that um, uh, you raised. The regulation of the professions is something that the um, faculty set, um, made uh, observations about in a submission um uh, to the UK government about uh, uh, in response to the internal market uh, uh, white paper uh, and I'm happy to uh, uh, arrange for a copy of that to be sent to the committee if that would be of um uh, assistance that would be helpful um, yeah okay um because um there are um currently um uh, arrangements for um uh, recognition um uh, as between um uh, or cross qualification would be a better way of uh, describing it as between uh, the parts of um, uh, the UK. Uh, there are provisions currently for recognition of professional qualifications from other member states in the EU, which have uh, as their, in their origin in um, uh, EU uh, legislation. Um, so the issue uh, is um, a, a real one. Um, it is not confined uh, to the legal profession, as I am sure members of the committee are aware there are a number of professions which are regulated and whose qualifications are cross-recognised in this way. Um, the um, question then, uh, is there the possibility for um, a conflict? Um, we do not know the shape of the internal market legislation at the moment. Uh, the white paper published by the UK government uh, suggests um, a, a number of things uh, about um, uh, respect and equivalence, um, uh, but um, uh, quite the form in which that is going to um, be enacted in legislation remains to be seen. Um, but in principle, there is, uh, I think, uh, the possibility of um, a conflict between uh, legislative choices made under uh, the continuity bill uh, and under uh, internal market um, uh, legislation. How should those be resolved? Well, um, I heard uh, in the earlier session uh, Professor Keating talking about uh, intergovernmental uh, relations and uh, the um, uh, the weaknesses uh, of um, uh, processes there, uh, which are sometimes um, uh, uh, evident. Um, uh, what I would say about that is, one would uh, hope for there to be a clear and explicit process for um, uh, resolution of um, difficult of uh, the choice of who is going to legislate or uh, how differences between uh, regimes, uh, one crafted by the UK uh, Government and Parliament, one crafted by the Scottish Government and Parliament, how uh, those uh, would be uh, resolved. Um, 
at an earlier stage, it had appeared as if the common frameworks were to be the uh, the tool for that. But the relationship between the common frameworks and the internal market, as described in the white paper, um, seems to me not entirely clear. Um, and that's a matter uh, which um, perhaps bears further scrutiny. That's all I'd want to say about that. Thanks. There's some uh, masterful understatement going on here. Uh, one would hope. Uh, for a, uh, a you know a, an arrangement that can resolve conflict, but at the moment, would it not be fair to say that that's a pretty far off hope? Are you asking that to me or some of the witnesses, Patrick? Uh, to follow that up with Mr. Campbell, and then then I'll come to Mr. Clancy. <laughs> um, well, um, uh, I think uh, all, all, all I can say in in, in response to that, Mr. Harvey, is that. Uh, uh, the, um, the the white paper on the internal market um, uh, is um, quite opaque on this issue. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, I think it remains to be seen uh, how that issue plays out. Okay, uh, Mr. Clancy might want to address the same issues and and perhaps going beyond just professional qualifications into wider aspects about the provision of legal services. Which the the law society obviously has a, uh, an interest in in that topic, and you know a, again, is there the potential for conflict? How should those conflicts be resolved if they do arise uh, in terms of the, the market for legal services? It's a very interesting question, Mr. Harvey, um, or set of questions, and I'm not entirely sure that we've got long enough to explore them all sufficiently deeply. But um, uh, let's give it a shot. Uh, so, um, as Mr. Campbell has uh, indicated, um, it, there is a provision in uh, the law at the moment uh, for intra-UK uh, transfers, uh, uh, and we have a set of qualified lawyers' assessments, uh, which uh, allow lawyers from other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, such as barristers uh, or uh, solicitors uh, from England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, the Channel Islands, uh, to be able to requalify into Scotland, uh, and uh, that that's been a very settled part of of the law for some considerable period of time. In fact, uh, I remember dealing with the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Scotland Bill in 1990, uh, which had provisions about. I'm not sure the extent to which the proposed consultation on uh, mutual recognition uh, and international um, uh, qualifications uh, will uh, apply to the legal profession. I think that's still um, uh, to be uh, to be provided. The, the consultation hasn't been issued. It's, there is a one paragraph reference to this in the uh, uh, white paper of the internal market. And so, therefore, it's probably inopportune to try to dip into that and see if, if there's, there's an issue which is germane to the question which you ask about conflict. There may be conflicts dependent upon what the internal market bill provides. Uh, we know that the government uh, wants to, uh, the UK government, uh, wants to make sure that there is a market access uh, provision uh, which is determined by the two principles uh, of mutual recognition uh, and, uh, and non-discrimination, and, and that that will apply to goods and services. Uh, and so, uh, services are currently governed by uh, the, uh, the services regulation, uh, which uh, is uh, part of uh, UK law, uh, and will be, uh, and it's fully adopted into UK law. Um, uh, so, uh, I think that the services aspect, no matter what services we're talking about, could be accountancy services, might be uh, services of, of other descriptions, IT services, uh, for example, might be a popular uh, pick in uh, the days. Um, uh, people providing video screen services, you know, all of these platforms which we now use uh, might become subject to this. 
Is there a potential for a conflict? Well, that depends. It depends on what EU law determines, and it, deter it depends on whether Scottish ministers will decide, seeing that EU law, uh, what uh, they will do uh, in terms of implementation in terms of the continuity bill. Uh, that's the farthest I can go at the moment uh, uh, without uh, without entering into vast realms of speculation. Um, but uh, I, I think that that's, that's where, it, where it lies. I, I appreciate that we can't really speculate in detail about specific divergences that might arise if the Scottish Government keeps pace with the EU, the UK Government wants to diverge from it, and, and there's, a, there's a mismatch within the UK's internal market. But in such a scenario, if it did arise, should it be the case that the Scottish Government is in a position to decide that the benefit they are seeking to achieve by keeping pace with the EU is substantial enough, and the downside of, of a, a mismatch within the UK is, is minor enough, and that they should proceed with that plan? Or would, would it be uh, is, is there an argument in principle for saying that they should not be able to do that, and the UK must have the power to overrule them? That question is really one which a, a future Scottish minister could answer, uh, and I'm not in that position uh, to be able to say what a future Scottish minister would do. But um, I'm quite sure uh, that conflicts already arise uh, in mm. uh, the approach to which the uh, governments uh, of the four nations uh, uh, decide to do in terms of their policy choices. And those conflicts have to be resolved, and, and that is part of this intergovernmental review process, uh, which we have still to see the publication of, of the uh, findings of that and, and what it means for uh, each of the four uh, governments within uh, these islands. And I think that that is certain uh, to require some form of dispute resolution. And why do I say that? Because there is already some form of dispute resolution uh, in the Concordat and Memorandum of Understanding between uh, the UK Government and the devolved administrations, uh, which sets out how uh, certain forms of dispute can be resolved. And principally, uh, these involve references to the civil servants to come up with a solution which will satisfy uh, all the governments. But in the end, it becomes a political decision uh, if that, that initial solution is not accepted by the governments. Uh, and it depends on politicians being able to uh, make an agreement, uh, resolve the question between them uh, as to what happens. And we have seen that in certain aspects of the common frameworks, where, as in the Agriculture Bill, which we have talked about, um, uh, there are provisions in uh, that bill where the Scottish Government has agreed uh, through, uh, through a uh, legislative motion, which has been passed by the Parliament, uh, to include provision applicable to Scotland in the Agriculture Bill, and has not yet agreed on other parts, uh, uh, which might be part of a future LCM. So clearly, there has been discussion between the governments, and they've reached a decision about those parts which they can live with, and those parts which the Scottish Government cannot live with. It's a political process, and I firmly expect that that political process will be one which will continue uh, in the internal market discussions. Okay. And Listen, I, I don't, th thanks, Patrick. I don't want to keep this this particular thread going uh, in much longer, but there's a, a, an obvious question um, that uh, has come to, to mind, um, and that is to what extent UK ministers use secondary powers in the UK Brexit bills to diverge from EU law, including in devolved areas. And given that SSI's tool does not apply, does that not give rise to even more potential areas of conflict and emphasise the need for that dispute mechanism to be in place? And Michael, you want to start off, and Kenneth, 
and, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry to interrupt in this process, but I think it's important to just tease that out a bit more. Um, if you could just make your answers as snappy as you can. We're moving on a bit here. Cheers. Um, <clears throat> thank you, convener. I would uh, would like to, to consider uh, the way in which which you've uh, phrased this question. I'm not sure that the EU Withdrawal uh, Act 2018 um, uh, provides um, UK ministers with the power uh, to depart from EU law. Uh, but certainly, EU the UK, and so it will be a, a, not an issue for uh, UK ministers to decide. Uh, in terms of EU retained law, that is domesticated law, which uh, which is applicable to uh, to the UK uh, and derives from EU law. Then, of course, part of the entire project uh, of enacting such legislation uh, is to enable UK the, the UK Parliament and, uh, in certain instances, the devolved legislatures to depart from. Uh, retained EU law. How that will happen and at what point, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, one can imagine that divergence will occur in the not too distant future uh, after the end of the transition period. If satisfactory policies are, are identified by the, uh, the relevant ministers. Okay. Now, I I think I would probably want to take the take the question back, reflect okay, on it further, and maybe write okay. to you. Okay, thank you, Kenneth. You got any quick response to that? Um, if, if possible. Uh, yes, very, 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 very briefly. Michael Clancy has described uh, the operation of the EU Withdrawal Act and the uh, uh, and the intention underlying it. I agree with him uh, that it is um, foreseeable. That divergence from um, uh, what will be the future direction of EU law uh, uh, is very is is possible, probably likely, um, uh, by amendment of what will become retained EU law. I think the important thing to say is that that um, is likely, whether or not uh, the powers in the the bill that we're considering today uh, exist. Um, yeah. uh, and um, uh, the, broad, the, the broader effect uh, uh, of that um, uh, is um, probably out with the scope of our um, discussion today. Yeah, but that could well involve statutory instruments in devolved areas which are not suitable, and therefore we're back into the potential area of conflict. I, I, again, Michael says he'll reflect on that. Can yeah. I move on? Sorry, Dean Lockhart. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, convener. I'd like to raise with uh, this panel the same uh, issues I, I raised in the previous panel. First of all, the, the Environment Committee last week heard evidence that under the EU Continuity Bill, it will be an open question on whether Scotland keeps pace with the EU, adopts similar standards to the rest of the UK, or takes a completely different tack. Given the uh, discretionary powers of the Scottish Government to keep pace with some but not all of future EU laws, I'd like to ask the panel, is there a risk that Scotland could end up in some kind of regulatory no man's land where we are out of sync with both EU regulations and out of sync with regulations in the rest of the UK? Uh, perhaps Michael Clancy uh, could uh, start with that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed, Mr Lockhart. <clears throat> um, I think if one were to uh, reflect on the current situation, um, it is perfectly possible for the Scottish Parliament to enact legislation which is different from that in any other part of the UK. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, we don't refer to that as being, uh, in any kind of a way, uh, anything other than a natural consequence of devolution. And so, therefore, in the future, if uh, there is EU law on one side, UK law on another, uh, and uh, the uh, Scottish Parliament 
decides to uh, maintain a different approach to policy making uh, and enact legislation uh, which reflects that different approach to policy making, then that would be a natural consequence of devolution, and it would be a, a political and uh, and policy question uh, for. Uh, those who are scrutinising legislation at that time to argue uh, the pros and uh, I think that that's probably as far as I would go on on uh, answering your question. Yes. Can I follow up on that? I, I, the previous position under EU law was obviously there there wouldn't be any discretion. On the part of where, where European law applied, there wouldn't be any discretion in terms of whether or not to follow that law. The EU Continuity Bill, however, does introduce that element of discretion, where the Scottish Government uh, can can pick and mix whichever e future EU laws it, it uh, follows or, or decides to follow. So, I, I guess there is that incremental level of additional uncertainty that the continuity bill may introduce? It is certainly the case that Scottish ministers can make regulations corresponding to EU law, um, uh, however that is defined, um, and that does naturally uh, potentially create a, a difference of approach uh, from uh, other governments within uh, the UK. Uh, but. Uh, that is part of, of any political uh, legal process. Um, uh, the politicians set out uh, the objectives they want to attain uh, and uh, how they want to attain them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it is up to Parliament to scrutinise those questions uh, closely when they arise. Thank you. Perhaps I could ask uh, Mr Campbell for his contribution on, on some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Lockhart. Um, I, I agree with um, uh, what um, uh, Michael Clancy uh, described as the um, uh, the natural consequence of uh, uh, devolution, in the sense that uh, uh, the Scottish Parliament um, uh, uh, has and can legislate uh, in uh, uh, devolved areas in a way which is um, different from uh, policy in the equivalent area elsewhere in the UK. Uh, the only other thing which uh, I would add in the, the context specifically of uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, variance within uh, the UK is that um, thinking about an earlier part of our discussion, the uh, uh, the internal market uh, white paper uh, which the UK government is co currently consulting on, the principles of um, mutual uh, recognition and non-discrimination are said to be central there. Uh, and so. Um, uh, services, um, products uh, originating in Scotland, uh, in uh, produced or provided in accordance with uh, uh, rules uh, devised by the Scottish Parliament uh, under um, uh, this bill, uh, uh, ought uh, therefore to be recognised uh, and able to be consumed um, uh, elsewhere uh, in the UK by application of uh, of those principles. Assuming that uh, they are thereafter enacted uh, in legislation to give effect uh, to um, uh, the current thinking about uh, a UK internal market, so the, uh, if there is, if there is a concern about um, disadvantage to um, uh, Scottish uh, providers of goods and services uh, um, uh, uh, on the face of it, uh, those principles uh, uh, in the internal market uh, white paper, if they are enacted, um, uh, would. Uh, um, uh, benefit um, uh, the providers of those goods and services. Thanks. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Convener. That's all they had. Thank you. Hey, thanks. I'm conscious, um, colleagues, that we're now coming close to 11:45, and we must conclude by midday. But I've still got Jackie Bailey. I think Angela Constance. I'm not sure if Alec really wants in, but Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener, and I'll try and be quick. My my question is to Mr. Campbell. Um, and obviously, when we think about the interaction of the continuity bill um, with the UK government's proposals for the internal market, um, do you think that the aims of the bill could, in practice, be undermined by litigation? <laughs> 
Well, um, it's always uh, unwise to uh, um, try to forecast the outcome of litigation in which uh, you're not involved as a lawyer, I, I, I have found uh, through many bitter years. Um, I think that um, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly possible that there will be litigation about the interaction uh, of um, these um, uh, two um, uh, legislative structures, assuming that there is legislation about uh, the internal market. Um, while it's possible to foresee that, I think it's more difficult at this stage to foresee um, how that, uh, what uh, components uh, the litigation might be about, and therefore um, to be able to forecast in any um, way that's going to be helpful an answer to your question is, uh, uh, would the, the aim of this um, uh, legislation uh, be uh, undermined? Um, I think it's uh, just not possible to predict that at this stage. But, but you could see, I suspect, a set of circumstances where the Scottish courts um, might be encouraged, if you like, um, to diverge from existing EU case law at the same time as Scottish ministers are trying to maintain alignment. What do you think the implications of that would be? Um, uh, I think uh, that you are um, uh, alluding there to uh, uh, yet a further um, uh, post-Brexit uh, uh, development, which is um, uh, the power um, uh, which uh, uh, UK uh, ministers have uh, to specify courts which can uh, depart uh, from existing case law and about which there has uh, a consultation has uh, recently closed. Um, uh, the, uh, that consultation, without uh, taking up the committee's time um, uh, about that, uh, is um, uh, complex and challenging. Uh, it doesn't amount to, in, uh, in, in, in the faculty's view, it doesn't amount to a directive to the courts. Uh, to change the law, uh, but does um, seek to explore circumstances which the courts could, in uh, um, some cases, uh, decide to depart from existing case law. So it's um, uh, it's permissive rather than uh, mandatory in that sense. Um, you're quite right that some people might then take that as an opportunity to encourage the courts to exercise uh, such a power. It's difficult to um, foresee the context in which that might be done, um, not least because um, cases are decided against the background of the law uh, as it is, uh, unless the underlying law um, uh, has changed uh, the underlying retained EU law as it would be. Uh, it's difficult to see how um, uh, a court uh, would uh, be persuaded to depart from it in the absence of some compelling new factor. It might be that that compelling new factor uh, could be the changed um, UK internal market. That is a possibility, but beyond that, it's difficult to forecast what that would look like. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, that takes you to Angela Constance. Hey, I've heard enough, convener. Thanks. Okay, um, Alec Rowley. Is Alec still in the room? Okay, I'm not hearing anything back from Al Alec. But given that we are now at 11:50 or, or almost there, uh, I propose to conclude this meeting. And in doing so, can I thank Kenneth Campbell, QC, and Michael Clancy for their evidence today? Very helpful. That concludes the only item on the agenda today, and I now close this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, those for, who gave evidence to us. <laughs>